So, today, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I hope you have all read very carefully the, <laughs> the document, especially the two discussions. Um, what we're going to be discussing here is part of a um, larger research that we're trying to, to do at WIPO. WIPO is the World Intellectual Property Organization, and there we have an economic analysis unit, which in particular, what refers to innovation is the unit where I work and I try to lead. Uh, and one of the, um, the lines of research, one of the avenues that we try to, to walk uh, is on gender. Gender gap, right? Uh, any kind of, of gender gap related with innovation. Of course, given that we are an intellectual property organization, we have a lot of IP data. IP is how we refer to intellectual property and we are better at measuring the gender gap in patents and now we are trying to do also in industrial designs and eventually in trademarks that we might be into um, measuring this in, in other data. So what they're going to be explaining today has a little bit of a summary of everything that we do. We're going to focus mostly on a report that was recently published uh, that discusses 20 years of data, of PCD data, the Patent Cooperation Treaty. And uh, I'm going to tell you of what are we attempting to do next with this. Hopefully I can convince you that this is interesting, given that, uh, given that you are in Sciences Po, our point is precisely to see how we can design policies to sort it out this and to design those policies. We hope to be able to measure the phenomenon and, and say something meaningful. Um, so the second part of this presentation is going to be about that, about how we try to disentangle a little bit what we observe in the data. And uh, hopefully you can give me great ideas of how to go on, because we are just starting that part and we have some intuitions. We are not super happy of what we are finding, uh, and I can tell you why later. Um, but uh, we are very curious and it would be really, really nice. And, and you guys are going to see also that we develop a lot of methodologies based on this. So. If you happen to do a dissertation on this topic and you want to try to do some general analysis, you might be interested in some of those um, methodologies. So, it would be nice if I'm the right screen. There we go. So, motivation, right? Do I need to motivate why we should study the gender gap? I guess that at least for half of you, it should not be needed to motivate this. Um, there is, of course, a very simple humanitarian approach. On this, we should try to sort it out because it's not good that 50% of the population gets some kind of barrier to exert their creativity and, and innovativity. And, um, but this also, given that I'm an economist and, and some of you may have some economic training or interest for that, we should care also if we are very uh, selfish people, we should care because we are actually resigning the possibility of accessing 50% of the creativity and the ingenuity of people. Imagine that you have women that have great ideas, but they cannot innovate, they cannot create their companies, they cannot uh, do the patents or research. We are losing that for humanity, not only for that person. So if you're not convinced on the uh, humanitarian approach, you should at least be convinced on the economic one. Uh, this is, of course, with the big assumption that innovation is something good. Right, that the technological progress generates spillovers for the society, I don't know, extended lifespan, better tools to connect and people not needing to be here, maybe vaccines for the <laughs> pandemics, etc., etc., etc. Of course, we can be all very fearful of the AI that will leave us all of us without jobs, which is also part of the technological progress. Okay? So, um, we, well, not only we, the literature also documents that there are many, many barriers for women to participate, right? And they are of very, very different natures. We do an attempt in, in the study that we share with you, but also in a previous study and in a study that will come later on, uh, document a little bit the literature and the policies on this. The, the one to come is going to be better in that sense. We have documenting also a bit of the policies that have been applied to, to try to address the issues of... Um, of gender gap in innovation. But there are a few things that are, you know, quite documented, maybe sometimes for smaller samples or for um, some specific cases, but quite, quite interesting. 
Of course, not surprisingly, uh, there is something related with motherhood or the role that women have in society. We know that this is a barrier for women participating, right? The more women have uh, difficulties to, to access a, a market or, or studying, they will be a little bit um, off of that uh, place. Uh, if there are no nurseries, for instance, that can also happen, that uh, it will limit the participation of women. Of course, it doesn't need to be the case that women is the one that stays at home and more and more men are staying at home, but actually it is quite often that in many cultures it is the woman that stays at home. There is, of course, even when they participate, quite often a discrimination for removing them from the credits, right? There's a literature, here you have a few, Jens and Alisoni, where you observe, for instance, um, you compare the participation of, of, of a team in a scientific publication, and then you observe the same team in the patent. And you try to see who is dropped from one to the other. And not surprisingly, you are more likely to be dropped if you're younger. Uh, you are more likely to be dropped if you're a woman. Uh, and uh, you are less likely to be dropped if you are the director of the lab. <laughs> right? All things that are a little bit trivial, but uh, it's interesting that we can measure that at least partially. There are, of course, uh, other reasons beyond what I just mentioned. It's more related to culture, if you want, and, and, and uh, nurseries or the kind of institutionality that can help on that, or the, let's say, hopefully uh, implicit bias, right? Unconscious gender bias sometimes could be very conscious, unfortunately. Uh, but there are also some elements that have been shown that the organization matters, right? We observe that in, in in certain careers, there is more presence of women, and in certain other careers, there are less presence of women. Uh, some studies have even documented this quite quite young, right? The selection, well, I challenge you, go to a toy store. If you guys were too young, you have kids, maybe some of you already have, I have two kids. It was always very funny to go to a toy store because you can see very clearly what society is trying to pass to the kids about that, right? They, I um, always remember how pink was the alley for women, uh, and the Barbie pink is probably not helping on that, but uh, maybe the Inter Miami of Messi in pink maybe help, and boys start using a bit more pink. Um, but also there is some very interesting studies looking at the kind of organizations, for instance, private companies they seem to be more aggressive uh, environment for women to participate. So they often feel more comfortable in academia than in, in academic research centers than, than in private sector. Uh, also, there's a question of groups, the dynamics of groups, the kind of uh, hierarchical structure of a group. There's a study, for instance, that documents that in biotech, women, they feel more comfortable because the groups are more horizontal. They share more information like this. There's not much this head of the lab that you have to comply, that you may find more in physics or engineering or things like this. Of course, it depends on the country and so on, but this is quite interesting documentation on this. Some of the, the elements um, that are cited here go in that direction. I invite you to, to check any of this if you are interested, but um, this is quite systematic. Then there is other elements which um, relate with uh, competitive pressure, for instance, on, on, on competition. There seems also that there is a self-selection of some agents that they don't like aggressive environments, particularly women, but not only. Minorities in general, they don't like aggressive uh, environments like finance, just to give an example, which can be very, very aggressive, very masculine, very boys club in that sense, and it's quite documented. Um, of course, another element that's quite interesting is there are studies that have looked at um, exporting companies compared to non-exporting companies. And of course, exporting companies, they may need to liaise with people in different time zones, which means that you have to work longer hours or outside of normal hours, or you need to travel a lot. And again, these are elements that discriminate against women participating, right? Um, there is also um, an element, well, there, there are a couple of interesting elements. Um, this literature looks at transparency. So, for instance, they have looked at calls for, for, for jobs, job description. Actually, we just recently sent a, a fellowship call and we corrected, because it's a mistake that we often do, that if you do not declare the salary in the thing, women actually will be less tempted 
to apply for some reason than men. They have tested that. Apparently, there is a phenomenon there. Um, this goes a bit more on behavioral science and so on, but there is information. There's also some uh, elements about um, tech transfer. And if there is better documentation and better information on how the procedures are, then women will participate more, while if things are a bit more obscure and you need to basically use your networking to get access to some of the information, women will left be, either they're going to be left out or they will feel left out and so on, right? That's the thing. The phenomenon is not very clear, or it's probably not uh, unidimensional how it happens, but it's, it's, it's quite happening, right? And as I mentioned, in some of these competitive sectors, there is a, a self-selection of women of not participating there, which is, of course, not desirable, right? We want everybody to have the same chance. Um, let me see if I'm thinking. Ah, another important element, uh, why I mentioned briefly a little bit, is about groups, the teams. So women tend not to work alone, or let's say, or tend less to work alone. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, than, than men. Uh, they feel more comfortable in, in a team. They feel more comfortable in a team that has at least another woman participating on it. Uh, we probably, everybody has heard at least one awful story with a friend about this. So there are good reasons why that happens. And unfortunately, that shouldn't be the case, but it happens. Um, and as I was mentioned, right, there is also this, this idea of hierarchy. Sometimes younger scholars, and particularly women, uh, will give up some of their rights of a patent just because they're in an early stage of their career or just to get a publication. They will resign to participate in the patent, which has a, 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 an element there, which is mm, relates with the, com the, 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 let's say, averse of competitiveness and, and, and aggressivity, because you're talking about something that gives you reward and recognition, and something that gives you economic reward and recognition, right? So they will give away their economic recognition for the other reward, which is not something that we desire as a society, right? If someone does a patent, deserves to be named an act, and actually many, many legislations, if not all, if you are not naming an invention in a patent, that's a reason to invalidate the patent. <laughs> so it's, it's even not desirable that women's are discrimination, at least for the, the potential um, legal uh, stability of the patent. Okay, last um, but not least, there is also an individual element that, which is gonna, we're gonna see is the hardest to measure. Uh, there are some studies trying to see, and not only for gender, but also for minorities, they try to see what's the environment where the kid develops, and if that has an influence in participating in intellectual activities, including inventing, and there is some, some proof of that. So it is, there are studies that try to see that if there was an inventor living in near your neighborhood or near your house at an early age, you have way more um, probability to become an inventor than in the future. So clearly the environment, the, 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 uh, how do you say? the, the people you can project yourself, right? They can inspire you, uh, play a role. And of course, uh, you quite often, you, you find as a reference, as a model, not, not always, but quite often, someone of the same gender. So if you lack models of your same se gender, you're less stimulated to participate, or if you're same ethnicity and so on. There's also some interesting studies looking at uh, siblings, right? You, you may know from other literature that typically the, um, the second or third uh, son or daughter, they're less likely to finish university, but they are more likely to do artistics and more liberal things, while the first one is more <laughs> uh, likely to finish university by doing more boring careers. Um, interesting, when they extend this for, um, for gender and, and patenting, um, the, if, if you are the first uh, daughter and there's no second uh, sibling, you're more likely to have a patent that if you are first a daughter and, you and then that couple has a boy, uh, which indicates a little bit of what kind of the motivations that may be happening in that family, the, the role models and so on, which again, is, is hard to measure, it's also hard to, to have policies on this, but, uh, but it seems certainly interesting. And, a little bit worrisome for us, the parents, of what are we doing with our kids. So, as um, we like to, to say here, uh, there are many, many factors happening at the same time, right? It's, it's, it's hard to, to disentangle what, what each of them may actually mean 
for the overall gap, which we're going to describe in a second. However, what we can at least understand is that these layers, right, they're not the same. And the policies to address these different layers are not the same. And this is a little bit the point of the entire research that we're trying to do. We're going to observe some statistics that documents a little bit of this, not everything, because it's hard to measure. And we're still working on some creative ways of measuring some elements. But the results are, are even if there might be meaningful in all of them, the, the weights that they may have, the impact that they may have, are not trivial. Because it's not the same policy that we need to address if the problem, let's say, is individual at the level of the family or the person, or if it is at the level of the country and, and institutions like lack of nurseries or etc., or if there is some bias in one industry or actually a, a lack of supply also in an industry, right? There is a big, big challenge. Um, Many people, they feel comfortable with this, no, but if there's not enough supply of women in this particular field, it's not our fault, right? We, we, we try to hire the best one, and there are less, in that pool of, of skills, there's less women, right? So then, uh, that's, of course, a very comfortable from the, from the demand side, but, uh, but it means that then we have to have policies that address that. Uh, but if the problem is more at the organization culture, if you have a... An, you know, some, some industries or some companies that they are very toxic and so on, then there's a clear action that you have to go and do there. So this is a little bit what we are trying to, to achieve. So um, this is an empirical study. We are looking at uh, a little bit more than three and a half million international patent applications filed through the PCT system in a little bit more than 20 years. Yes, there's a question about what is PCT? No, I was going to say that now, but yeah. No, Go ahead. Like, it was regarding the previous uh, graph. I was like, I wanted to, uh, like, uh, I wanted to uh, give a provocative question. Okay. Uh, I, I, <laughs> let's see if I'm provoked. <laughs> you uh, want me to put the slide so that it no, stimulates no, your your. No, no, no. Do you think on the previous six uh, like layers? Do you think it's an there is missing a seventh layer. Oh, I'm sure they're mi missing uh, 30 layers, not, uh, not only a seventh one. But yes, which one? Well, I'm, I would be very glad to hear which, which is the one that's missing, according to you. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. I, I'm thinking, like, because uh, the country's culture and institution, yeah. which is the outsider layer. Yeah, this is you guys, right? Sense Po is all about this layer. <laughs> right? yeah, it's very, like, country specific. Whereas, uh, like, patriarchy, it's a like, world phenomenon? I don't know. It's an excellent question, right? And you can say, is how much patriarchy happens here or here? Yeah. Right? Because we have also, particularly in this country, very multicultural cultural settings. No, like which that. generate tensions as well, which should not enter in this discussion by any ways. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Just because, like, it's very, like, I feel that it's very graphic to understand like what policy implications and where where to like what policy address what yeah uh, and I like it's very like, I do see like that the upper level is like country specific there like it's something more like bigger <laughs> but just that what, what would be bigger God <laughs> the the genome <laughs> what was that? I don't know. Um, fair enough I do believe that many countries, uh, they will share some cultural traits uh, and others they will share uh, institutional settings, right? We can go as, as trivial as discussing uh, common law and civil law in Europe uh, or discussing language, right? How much language uh, basically transfer culture. Um, there's also a way of thinking already in the language setting. Uh, sometimes you don't find a, a, a word in a different language and you know that in a second or third language and you see it's very precise and the lack of that word means something as well. So I think you're totally right, but uh, I don't know if there's something bigger, but I do think that any of this and even interactions of this, um, and we're going to give you a quantitative measure also of that, is, um, is very yet not measured, right, and important and relevant, uh, and I hope you're going my battery is running low. This is a problem. <laughs> Let's um, try to sort it out while we speak. Um, see here. Oh. So I was telling you. So who knows what the patent is in this very brilliant team of people? 
and it's not distracting looking at something else in the internet while I speak, trying that David is not looking. I think you should do with the camera like this, and you can see exactly what all these people is looking. Um, who's brave enough to tell me what the patent is? Yeah, you look brave enough. It's um, a document that um, gives someone ownership over one night um, uh, an invention. Ah. <laughs> I think we, I, I was just disconnected, sorry. We need to fix that while we explain what a patent is. I'm sure that David and the other ones already know what a patent is. Uh, so, ah, that's not very smart what they did. So it's a patent ends being a, being a document, but it's a right, right, that you get. So right to ownership over, over a certain invention. Basically, only those who have a patent can produce that invention. It's a slightly more nuanced than that. So a patent system was created to give economic incentives to inventors to innovate, right? With the idea that by doing that, we're going to compensate the problem. We have one, two, three. You guys want to co complement the answer? Is that this? Okay, sure. Why not? Do my job. I like that. <laughs> what, what kind of? Royalties. Fair enough. Yes, you can get. So that means that it's not only about uh, that. Yeah? Patents normally dictate a region and a time frame. So uh, just because you have a patent in Europe does not necessarily mean you have a patent in Asia because there is that's not necessarily. Just true. if you have a patent in France, doesn't mean you have a patent in Germany, yeah, even. Yeah. Specific and time specific, <laughs> and that's why you're trying to say this argument with it, it creates an incentive to R and D, the potential right to sell within a specific region for a specific time frame. But then, after this time frame is gone, then the then, you're, then you no longer hold the right for sole production of your innovation. Uh, maybe. It's correct, but so that was very technically accurate. Um, but as an economist, I like to go one step higher, which is you want to give inventors or the applicants, basically the holders of the patent, an incentive to innovate and to invest in R&D, which was basically what your uh, classmate just, just mentioned. And you're also going to give the person uh, the right to exclude others of using that technology. You don't need to exert that right, right? You, 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 and you're not even obliged to produce that, which is a little bit of the tricky of the patent, right? You can create a technology and sit on that technology and not anyone use the technology. But it doesn't mean that you are the only one to, to produce a technology. You can also do, is, are we connected again or not? Yeah. You can um, ah, now I'm thinking. Uh, you can also allow for a specialization. Imagine that you are very good at innovation. Okay, now we have the audio problem again. Uh, it's now better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and now I have to share the screen. Host disabled participant screen share. You have to allow me to. But I cannot. It says to the host screen share. <laughs> Almost. Um, so imagine that you're very good at, at, at creating technology, but you're not that good at um, producing, right? Or the other way around. You're very good at producing, but you're not very creative. So. The patent tries to generate a transferable good from an intangible and allow for a market for technologies, which is not very perfect, right? And we're still getting slowly better at this. But ultimately, it's about this. It's about trying to transform something intangible into tangible and can be commercialized, transferred, and so on, which is this is why you have the right of uh, um, excludability, but at the same time, you can transfer that right. And yes, you were saying about royalties, so you could ask for royalties. Okay, you can have a license, you use my technology, and you pay me X percent for every unit produced, so you pay me a lump sum of money, and so on. You tell me if we are on. I think you can leave that uh, above. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, everybody, and especially the people remotely for that.
You have just missed a very boring explanation of what patents are. And within the world of patents, uh, as your colleague was saying, um, you can file a patent in several places. And there is, of course, a few international uh, institutions that try to, to assist applicants to file in several places. One is the European Patent Office, the EPO for, for Europe. But one that's more international than the EPO is WIPO with the PCT, which is the Patent Cooperation Treaty, and allows you. So this is data that, for us, is very interesting. One, because it's at our fingertips, it's in our databases, but also because it's more international. So you don't suffer of something that's called home bias, so you try to capture more or less what's happening in, in all countries. It's not a perfect measure as any patent measure, uh, but it's, it's quite good. And uh, for this, we're going to be looking at elements like the country of the applicants and the inventors. You can even exploit that nuance. We're not going to exploit it in this particular case a lot, but you can. You, have, uh, you can also categorize the applicants if they are companies, academia, or individuals, which can be a proxy for an entrepreneur. You can use what's called the IPC, the International Patent Classification classes, to look at the kind of fields that are involved in this. You can look, of course, at the applicant names to understand, for instance, if they are a university or a company, etc., but also other aspects, and we're going to discuss that later on. And uh, we can also see if the inventors are in smaller groups, in bigger groups, right? A patent can have at as few as one inventor, but it can have 50 inventors, right? If you want, if you, for instance, the CERN in, in Switzerland and France, they file for patents, and when they file for patents, given the, the size of the labs, they have 50, 70 people listed as inventors in that patent, right? Um, we have assigned the gender to the inventors of those patents using a methodology that we develop. And this is what I mentioned. This is the WIPO Walls Gender Name Dictionary. We are in the version 2.0. We may have a, a 3.0 coming next year, which allows you, either with Stata or with Python, to apply to any list of names and countries. So if you're doing research on this and you want to use it, please use it. You can have fun, maybe have some interesting statistics. And if you find mistakes, that you will certainly find mistakes, tell us and we will try to fix it. OK? All of that allows that you have almost 3 million patents, given that some of them, they don't have the names of the inventors. Some of the names of the inventors are wrongly input, or we cannot separate the first name. It's not very clear, so th there are some loss there. Uh, particularly, you may know, but Korean names and Chinese names are slightly more challenging to disambiguate than, than other names. Uh, we have improved a lot, and one of the solutions actually is using the names in the regional characters. And that improves a lot. The quality is still not great, but it's much better than if you use the Romanized version. This is if you are data geeks and you understand this. If you don't, don't worry. You don't need to understand this to go on in this presentation. OK, it would be nice to recover. There we go. So basically, we are discussing the results in this report, uh, where we try to understand what's the share of women uh, patenting, in our case, PCT. What is interesting is we did our first study on this in 2016, and since then, and many of them using our methodology uh, or improving it, uh, they kept doing the same thing. And we all find very similar results, right? The, the gender participation is uh, a little bit above 10%, some cases reaching 15, 16%, but not much more than that, which is, of course, not great. Yeah. What is the proportion of observations in the world? So non, non Australian, non US, non Europe? Uh, no, no. no. Not of women, but of observations. I assume it to be very small. No, no, th there is a lot. And this, is, this we're doing for the world. What I'm saying is this is other people. This is not us. Huh? This is us. What I'm telling you is other people doing at their samples, they found similar results. So only look at that Australian data. Okay. When you look at Australian data, you look, of course, at Australians filing for patents in what's called IP Australia, but also Americans, Europeans, whatever, filing there. Mining companies, for instance, of all the world, they are very interested in filing in Australia because there is a lot of competition there. Okay? The US, everybody wants to file in the US. It's one big market, right? So we want to protect. Europe is probably the second one in that terms together with China. Okay? So these are results from different studies, but show certain facts. And actually, the point of, of this part is to tell you that these results are very consistent regardless who does the study. They are not exactly the same results, but they are very consistent. For instance, the good news is that it doesn't matter which indicator you're using, 
all of them are progressing over time, right? Everybody's more or less finding this. So, you know, we are bad people, we are trying to, but we're trying to get less bad. That's the, the main results. The, of course, the bad news is that we're still very far from the mark, right? These are very, three different indicators. If you're very interested, I can, I can explain the details of the difference, but the most important one is this one, the 16, which we call the women inventor rate, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We do, and we have even a slide on that. Not a fantastic one, but <laughs> we can look at that in, in a second, but yes. So, the other um, thing that's quite consistent is that there is a lot of um, regional difference. So, here we are separating in regions based on the United Nations Statistics Division. It's a very specific one, but um, what you get here is the, the progression of the world. In most regions, you observe some kind of improvement. There is an exception here in Oceania, but you know, this is also there's some, some data that less is mostly Australia, to be honest, in Oceania. But um, the interesting result is Latin America and the Caribbean, which is mostly Latin America, because the Caribbean is not producing lots of patents, is actually quite good and improving, although they have much less patents, right? Well, so <laughs> this is not meaningful for the world. It's meaningful just for, for the region. But what is very meaningful is this is the fact that Asia is improving a lot, particularly China, and China is imp so Asia is improving for two reasons. One is because China is patenting a lot in that period, and China is way more egalitarian in that sense than the other Asian economies. But Japan, which used to be a disaster compared to the peers, is also getting much better. So there is an interesting thing there to look at what policies did Japan apply, because it seemed to be working. Right, so this is something to look at it, because when we did this study in 2016, Japan was really bad. And it was always the, the, the bad poster child, right? Well, okay, Japan looks bad, and it was showing like this. And now it's like, oh, Japan is doing actually much better. So they did something that worked. So in more detail, in case you don't believe <laughs> the regional results, you get also that in most countries, there are a few exceptions, India and Barbados. Barbados, so these are top applicant countries. And this is tricky, right? Why Barbados has so many patents? Well, because many multinational companies have their headquarters there. So it's not that they're doing research there, the inventors are not there, it's the headquarters that's there. And this is why you observe some, some you know, I, I, I will neglect this. However, in India, the results are a bit troublesome, right? And it should be understanding. And part of that is also because of the shift of the patenting, and we're gonna go on that in, in a second, actually in the next slide, uh, of what explains this in India. But if you see, in most countries, there is an improvement from what we observe at the beginning of the last two decades to now. And not surprisingly, you have many Latin American countries doing well, but look at Spain, right? And, and there are, every time you do the study, there are a couple of things that you are a bit surprised. You're expecting maybe the Nordic countries to do very well, and actually they're below average, right? We're supposed to be much more social state, yeah? Are you from a Nordic country? That's why? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering where are all the Eastern European countries? Because they have like, this particular tradition of a lot of women participation in sciences. Yeah, yeah well, Poland, does, I don't know if Poland is not there. No. But it could be. So this is top applicant countries. And I think uh, actually Lodi did a trick here. It was picking by region, some tops. So I think Eastern European is not appearing here because it's considered part of Europe. But we have data for Eastern European and they do well. For instance, Poland does very, very well. Yeah, Romania is also like yeah. very, very good. But we're going to discuss in a second why Eastern European countries also do well beyond some cultural elements uh, and why Latin America and Spain do well. Well, part of the explanation is this. Everybody that studies, they find this very strong pattern as well. It's not only that the countries have differences, but the fields or the industries have very, very much differences. Life science, they do quite well. They are definitely above one every four inventors being a woman, some cases approaching, slowly, but approaching one every three, something that is still not perfect, but much more correct. Look at the uh, more traditional mechanic engineering. It's a disaster, right? Not even one every 10 inventors is a woman. That's also a very consistent pattern. And the other interesting consistent pattern is even those disastrous ones, they're getting better over time, right? So again, Bad news, but slightly good news within those bad news. Okay? Yeah? I guess I'm smiling and you're happy or very disappointed, but I will assume the former. <laughs> so, um, another uh, very, very consistent pattern is uh, the, yeah. 
Of course. That one? So, this is coming from the IPC classification. You have to remember that patterns are classified not for us doing statistics, but actually to divide the labor across examiners. Which, by the way, there are very interesting studies also about discrimination in examiners or by examiners. And are controversial with the USPTO and the researchers, but thankfully not us. Um, so, what happens? A patent arrives to a patent office, and the examiners, the first look is, okay, this looks more like life science. No, this is more physics. And they split in six big categories. And within that, they keep splitting and splitting, and they can go very, very detailed. And they tag this for many reasons. One is labor sharing. You need to get someone who understands the technology to assess if it's patentable. But also, the, the, the elements that we didn't mention about the patent system is that those exclusive rights come with one condition. Do you know what's the condition we impose people filing for a patent? Uh, a little bit, but not a lot. It's not that, it's, that's not the, big, the most part that we are paying for the patent is not the fee, it's the lawyers and the translation. So, so there's not allowed to be a pre-existing patent. So you need to be able to have a searchable library. But even before that, even before, well, yes, but why? So what, why uh, do we have a searchable thing? No problem. But that's to make the lives of examiners easier. And that's part of the tagging too. But that's not what is in the law. You're asking people filing for a patent that, okay, I'm going to give you exclusive rights, but you have to share this information with everybody in the world. It has to be public. You can still exclude it, but people should know how you reach the technology. It's not a secret. So a patent is completely different from a trade secret. Right. It has to be public. People should be able to replicate your technology from the information of the patent. Many people challenge that assumption, particularly in pharmaceuticals, how much replicable they are or not, you can discuss. There are some fields that disclose more information than others, but by law, you have to disclose information because you should allow people, first of all, if they want to do research with that, they can do it without paying for, for it. And if they want to find an alternative method, right, what we call an horizontal innovation, they can also do it and that will not be infringing the patent. Right? The, 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 the blocking of a patent is vertical. It's someone who wants to develop something that is exactly the same or something that goes below your patent. Let's say if you invent AI and someone wants to use AI for automobile, they might need to pay for your AI, right? Because it's going deeper in that direction. May I? Yes? But then, then you could infer that your, uh, what you're showing here is not necessarily the percentage of inventors. You're showing the percentage of inventors plus the fastest copycats. So we are sure. Uh, as soon as they make their patent, like I file in Australia. Yeah. If I'm really, really good at the patent database in Australia, I could be skimming through that and filing a patent. You can. In, uh, yes. America. Yes. So, so you, you are certainly you, you are showing the shares of uh, inventors that are listed in a patent application, which may or not be granted. And given that these international patent applications. It can be even uh, more interesting. It might be granted in Germany and refused in Japan, right? Because every patent law may have small nuances of what is patentable. But you can do the same statistics just for granted patents. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a big change. Actually, it probably it's going to be, no, I don't know. I wouldn't say it because we're going to say it's going to be uh, bad for women, but I don't think the quality of the patents where women are participating are worse by no means. But I might, I might expect that in a big company, they might select the most valuable patents for uh, selected groups of probably less female teams um, because of all the things we discussed in the literature review. But to be tested, nothing, what I just said is pure speculation. Um, but it's true, you could do that. Another way of doing that, you can also even try to look of the same statistics for the more cited patents, right? the patents that are more influential. Because here we are counting as every patent is the same. But, I don't know, the patent for uh, the cure of COVID is not the same that a patent for a small incremental innovation, right? Although technically it's an incremental innovation, the cure of COVID, but the vaccine. Um, okay, going on, uh, sectors, right? We close sector structures to the type of organization. Uh, and you can see that Basically, PROs, right, public research organizations and universities, they follow more or less a similar pattern, and they're way above 
that what you expect in companies and individuals. And when you look at individuals, most of the time, right, you may have some crazy inventions in a garage, but most of the time, we'll, you tell me how bad we are doing eh? in time, given all the hiccups and all this. Um, but most of the time, they're entrepreneurs, right? And actually, we did a research that we never published, but if you look at the rate of individual patenting, it's usually higher in developing countries, especially if there's certain stability with the financial institutions. So if you fear that your company is going to get bankrupted, you're not going to file the patent in the name of your company. You're going to file it at your name. So in case you get bankrupt, you can reuse that patent for your next company. Right? So when you start you know, having a certain size and you have a line of credit and so on, you may actually file it. But you can see that the pattern is more or less similar, a bit more accelerated than individuals. But in any case, there's a clear distinction between academic related institutions and more private ones. Okay. Teams. That was your question, right? So the, the tricky part is that uh, you cannot look at gender of a team, right? You can see of the composition. And what we find, and it's interesting here, is we're going from only one man as an inventor listed, so a team of one person, a team only with men, a balanced team, no, mostly men team, <laughs> still, still bad, right? So most, mostly men means above 60% of the team being uh, men. Then balanced team, those are bet between 40 and 60%, right? Regardless of what you do, because it's symmetric. And then you have mostly women, uh, all women, and one woman inventor, which is the small blue one here. So one result of this, this is not the best chart to show this, but we have a table, I think, in the paper, maybe. Uh, or at least we, we had one, and maybe we remove it. What is interesting is that a lot of the progress that we have been observing before, and I was telling you always, the good news is that doesn't matter the field you look, there's a little bit of progress. You know what explains a lot of that progress? The fact that innovation is becoming increasingly harder. And you need more and more larger teams and multidisciplinary. Because actually, a lot of the reduction of solo men is explaining the other thing. And the reduction of only men is also explaining the, the increase of gender. And not necessarily the increase of one woman inventors or mostly. And actually, when you would separate the one woman inventor by a region, most of that woman invention growth is Asia, right? And probably just China. <laughs> so um, that's also something that is worth analyzing and, and looking forward. Um, and shows a little bit, yes. Just the range and distribution of team sizes. Because I'm thinking, if it's three people, then one more or less will be the same team I don't remember if we put that in the report, probably it did, but we did put that in another report, which was n we were not discussing gender uh, in 2019, where we actually looked for team sizes of scientific publications and patents. It's the World IP report in 2019. And I can tell you that, uh, yes, as in many cases, most of the teams are below six, right? Six and above is the, is the, is the tail of the distribution. And scientific publications usually have larger teams than than patents in general, uh, on average. That more or less answers the question. Yeah, that's why actually we, we picked 40 and 60, right? Because if you if you pick 50 percent and you're having three, it seems like unfair for the for the two and 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 and, uh, and one. So um, okay, moving on. What I just mentioned was about the stylized facts, right? These are things that we have consistently found in our statistics over time in, in several studies. When we look at different countries or regions, you get more or less the same picture. Of course, some regions higher, some regions lower. And all, but a lot of that might also be because of the specialization of that region or that country, which is what we're trying to accomplish here, right? We're trying to do a model where we try to predict the gender of a random inventor given all the rest of information. And hopefully by doing this, we can try to see which piece of the puzzle is more informative about the gender, knowing that all of them are informative, but some of them are more informative. So the metaphor here is, imagine you have a very large bag, 
and you put all the inventors inside, you put your hand, and you're going to pick a random inventor, and before checking out of the, of the bag, you have to tell me if it's a woman or a man inventor, and I'm only going to give you a little bit of information. I'm going to tell you, that inventor is in a big team. That inventor works in an applicant that's from academia. That inventor works in, um, what, in the field of uh, biotech. Right? And by giving all these pieces of information, you will need to give me your guess of the, of the gender of the inventor. We know that most of the time you should bet male, given how bad the statistics are, but with some information, sometimes you may bet for uh, being a woman or not. Right? This is what we're trying to model. I don't know how... This is, still a, this is a science book course, right? How, how deep are you guys with econometrics and all this? You have a lot of fun with this? You understand? Okay. This is trivial for you? Yeah? Excellent. Political economy course, not political science. Excellent, even better. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know which program. You are in a, in a, in a multidisciplinary program, right? Not in an economics program, correct? Multidisciplinary. Okay, okay, okay. Good to know, good to know. I should have researched this before the class. <laughs> um, so, correlation table. In the first column, you have the, um, basically the zero one, the dummy variable, if it's the inventor is or not a woman. So you already get a hint of what we're going to find by looking at that column and all the other variables. You have, of course, for some things, you have just some examples, uh, but you can already uh, capture. What is the largest effect? If I don't mistaken, you have two actually here. One is, if I tell you that that random inventor as a woman co-inventor, that is the most likely thing to predict that, uh, that, that that inventor is also a woman. Because because we mentioned that, right? They like to work in groups, they like to be with other women, or, or actually society pushes them to be in that situation, right? We don't know exactly how it works, but we see. On other elements, it's less clear, right? If we also know that if we tell you, okay, that inventor is alone, in the, in, this, in the patent, given this slide, you can already see, oh, okay, I'm going to bet it's a man, right? It's very likely it's going to be a man. If it's a small team and so on, the number of inventors has a positive correlation, right? The bigger is the group. We observe here a little bit also in the dummies. Uh, as we know, um, academia will have a positive influence on, on your likelihood, while company individual are negative. And when you start looking at the kind of fields, if you look at biopharma, you will have more confidence that's going to be a woman, while if it is chemicals, it's less than biopharma, but better than electronics. And of course, engines, transport is going to be worse, right? Negative. And as we were discussing before, some countries are going to have a positive one. For those here in the room who might be from France or are happy of living in France, there's a small positive effect for France. But uh, actually, Germany had a quite negative one right here. However, we are not controlling here for the multicollinearity of all of this. And this is the point that we are trying to do with the model. Yeah. Ah, no. I thought, no. I thought someone raised a hand. No, I, I, my bad. So what we try to do in these uh, attempts that we are doing is that we insert the variables by blocks first to understand how they work. And then uh, we insert all of them, including those that are coming in the next slides, in a third model with all of them together. Right? So first, to understand, okay, let's see how the, the block works, and then let's see when you introduce the other elements, what of the effect remains and what disappears. So, of course, being a small team is still very consistent, right? Regardless if you add other things or not. Well, you know, if he has a woman co-inventor, it has a strong effect. Yeah, no worries. Uh, but when you put the rest of the variables, that reduces. Still significant, right? Still. This is basically, this is the odds ratio. So this is 7%. You're 7% more likely or 10.5% more likely to be a woman if, um, if you have a woman co-inventor, right? And depending if you control for the elements. As I was saying, if you look at the different fields, there are a couple of usual suspects. Some things remain a little bit more stable. Others uh, change a little bit, but biopharma is still very, very strong. 12% in general. When you control for the stuff, it goes a bit lower, but still above 9%, so it's still a strong effect. Equivalent here, engines and transport is still a very strong and negative effect, like five, between 5 and 4.5% lower if you are from that. Of course, you may know these are dummies, so they depend on what is the reference. The reference here is sole inventor, while reference here, I don't remember. I oh, know, because it can be multi-industry. 
So here this is a constant, the, the reference. If we look at, uh, let me go to this side, if uh, you look at the kind of, uh, of applicants, as we saw, companies very strong effect, although when you control for sector, it goes much lower, right? Almost 8% here, uh, a little bit above 2%, and the same with individual, and actually for individual, it's not even significant anymore, right? So it's not significant different from zero. Here we use this reference in the United States because it's the bigger country filing for BCTs in that period. So this is all of them, if they're more or less. In red, you have the Latin American countries that we were mentioning before. You can see that uh, they have strong effects. Although, look, in the case of Argentina, how l much lower it, it is once you control for the structure. So what's happening for many of these countries? Um, quite common that in Spain or, or Latin America, the <coughs> biggest filings that they do, they correspond to two things. One, academic institutions, which we saw had a strong effect because the private sector, they do not invest a lot in R&D. And the second point is most of them, they do in life science, right? And a lot of them actually, they do in the Me Too, they're copying uh, molecules for other places. So uh, they don't have a lot of patents in mechanical engineering, et cetera. Brazil might be the exception, and that's why you see, because they have Embraer, right? They have, they have a lot of patents also in mining for Vale, but if not, uh, you don't observe. All the others, you observe a, a big reduction in the things. If you look at the um, European countries, I, I see here, I put three colors. If I remember correctly, blue is always positive, yellow is always negative, and green is changing depending once you control for the field. And interesting, we mentioned the Nordic countries, Denmark and Finland, they were actually not having a, a great score before, but a lot of that was explaining but the, their specialization, although in this case, Finland, when you control for everything, it gets positive. Well, Denmark was slightly positive and it gets <laughs> negative, but it's still not super large, and in this case, not, not very significant result, okay? Um, France, more or less stable, right? The more diversified a country is, uh, the more stable it's gonna be, right? Because they're gonna have, gonna be closer to, to the average of the world. And, okay, have here other examples. Spain that we mentioned before, look, it goes from 10.6% to 5.5%, so, Despite, so the, the, the message is nuanced. It's once you control for the structure, you see that, okay, it was less impressive, but still is a positive. So there's still something that Spain is doing uh, correct in terms of women participation that the others are not doing. Okay, to be like this. You guys are <coughs> very. No. So then, what of all of these elements is more important? So we are trying with this method, we're not yet fully, fully satisfied, trying to see if we can use this as a way of understanding w which of these effects is the most significant to understand what's going on. So uh, you may know this, this is uh, the ROC method, right? The, the area over the, the curve. So basically you have this curve that is like tossing a coin. Of course, um, this curve, in, in tossing a coin, it's 50-50. In this case, is the 84-16, right? If you want, as, as an example. It, it takes into account the average probability that you get. And the question is, by adding a layer of information, for instance, about the year, we saw that there is a the positive trend. So if I tell you that the inventor of that patent has filed in 2020, it's not the same information if I tell you that the inventor of that patent has filed in 2000, right? It increases the likelihood of observing a woman in that. We have also the, the teams and the country. We have the, the work ecosystem here measured by, by the type of um, uh, industry, no, because, yeah, by the type, by the type of, of applicant. And industry is a technological field. I'm not very in agreement with the labeling of this. I have to discuss this with Intan Elodi. But, and then you have in the red, the full model. So by looking at this, you can observe that the element that is bringing the most information to the model is the technological field, right? Because it's, it's the green, dark green one here, while the food model is just a little bit uh, above this. The other element you have in mind is this. Who was the person telling me about the seventh layer? You, right? How many layers do we have here still to investigate? Quite a lot, right? Well, technically, actually, a lot of the layers that we described in the literature review are very poorly proxied by the variables that we're using here, right? But what is interesting is that 
if we need to solve the problem, we need to keep digging because there is a lot of unexplained variation given what we are observing. We are trying to go a bit further on this. Um, and we are still, okay, let me see. Yeah. So we, we would like to go inside of the industry layer. Uh, one of the elements, and I'm going to show very preliminary results on this in the next slide, uh, which was not shared with you. <laughs> Sorry for the discussions, but it's just one slide. Um, we will also try to see if we can measure something about the applicants and the size, the corporate structure of the applicant, or even the concentration they may have in the industry. These are all elements that we're trying to see. We also try, we tried actually, but we were not super happy because the quality of the data was not great. If we can bring also some, some data from the country, like, you know, shares of nurseries, things like this, but this is too macroeconomic and the linkages between the two things seems a bit uh, too, too far away for us to be happy. But, you know, you can still find some correlations, but looking, if you have good ideas of variables, I would be very happy to hear. But let me then go very quickly on one thing that we were just testing these days. Okay, this is of course a test of how well you can see. But uh, more importantly, here you have the 35 technological fields that each pattern can be attributed to. And these are the same 35 technological fields but for the applicant. So we look for the applicants of the, of the patent and we look for the entire portfolio of patents of the applicant and we try to guess with that portfolio what industry the applicant is. So the question we're trying to answer here is, is the team of inventors that is working on life science going to influence more the gender or is it the fact that they're working maybe for, let's say, uh, Google? Right? Is, is, the, is the Google field uh, that determines more the gender or is kind of the knowledge space and of course maybe the path, the educational path that the research team has bringing to the patent. Not perfect measures either, but trying to go a little bit farther, right? And I don't know if you can see, but here in the diagonal, you have the, um, the real share of gender participation where the company and the patent are the same. Right, it's very small, and if you look at this, of course, you have to know the technological fields, which you don't know by heart, we need to put the labels on this, but basically, everything that is more or less here, until from 1 to 11, is on electronics, ICTs, semiconductors, this. Everything that goes on the 12 to 18, pharmaceutical, biotech, 18 is food chemistry, right? Uh, 13 is medical devices, so it's more life sciences. And everything that goes above is more traditional engineering, most of that, actually, if you want to have the car industry and civil engineering, there are the 30s here. Okay? And we have seen consistently that life sciences are much more inclusive, followed by ICTs, and the, of course the last ones are the more traditional engineering. So that's what we should expect. And what you can observe a little bit, what's interesting, is that what dominates the most is actually the field of the team and not the company. So when ICT companies, they start working in other fields, particularly in life science fields, which is this column here, they do better. Because here, when you're outside of the diagonal, basically we are telling you is what is the gender uh, balance that we are finding for those patterns that are done, let's say, from a company from the field one uh, that is not on field one, that is in field two, right? And you look at all, you need to have at least 13 ventures to be seen there. And this is projected as the difference to the, to the one in the diagonal. So if you're red, you're negative. If you're green, you're above that. Okay? Quite simple, traffic light, uh, we cannot relate. So you can see a lot of green here and a lot of green here. What's that? Traditional engineering companies, when they decide to do something on life science, they get greener. ICT companies, when they do something life science, they get greener. Life science companies, when they decide to do something outside of life science, which is here, they get redder. You see? So we still need to see how we're going to model that in the econometrics. We have not tested this with the other variables. This is for all countries, only 2020. We just have the same for 2000, less observations, but you get more or less the same pattern, right? So a little bit of consistency there, but that's how far we have reached that. We think there's something there, although policy implications of that are not great, because the policy implication of this is, oh, the problem is from the universities. They're not training enough people, right? They're, you're training too many women in life science and too little in ICTs, which is part of the problem for sure, but not all of the problem. So that's why we need to, 
to dig a bit deeper. Okay. Just, well, just to finalize, we are trying to look a bit further on all of this. And uh, um, hopefully we're going to wrap up all this more econometric part in a, hope, in a nice paper that you all will be citing and making very famous and so on. Or you're going to have come with a better paper and you're going to cite our methodology and it's still going to be happy. That's fine? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Thank you for your attention.